นะครับ Hey everybody, welcome to the seventh version of Red Bay, your one month vacation from capitalism. We've got a great weekend starting now. I want to Uh, clue you in first on tomorrow's event, which we are actually overjoyed with. Uh, it's called Lisa Vogel's Marxism and the Oppression of Women at 40. Uh, it's 40 years since that book by Lisa Vogel, a kind of uh, paradigm-changing book, Marxism and the Oppression of Women, was published. And we have a great panel to discuss uh, the book Kirsten Monroe, Chinzia Arutza, Paula Varela, Melda Yaman, and Sue Ferguson, uh, and I think possibly a surprise appearance. Uh, so do watch that tomorrow, it's at 1 p.m. But today we have another exciting event. Uh, uh, we have Cordelia Belton back. Uh, I think she's been part of the last two Red Mays. Uh, Cordelia, as I hope you know, uh, was one of the founders and hosts of uh, the much beloved podcast, Real Abstractions. And uh, she's put together a topic today that I find fascinating uh, simply from the title, Values, Judgments, Normativity, and Communist Practical Reason. I love the play on words of value, judgment, normativity I take to be the antagonist, traditional ethics, and communist practical reason is of course the one that entices. Is it like Aristotle's phronesis? Are we looking at something that's a Kantian term? Are we gonna have noumena and phenomena divided here? Or is Cordelia gonna ground this somewhere else or perhaps not grounded at all? The questions bristle in the air and I wait to hear them addressed. Uh, Cordelia has brought some of her comrades with her who I'd love to meet, so I will turn it over to Cordelia Belkin. What Belton, welcome back to Red Bay. Thank you, Philip. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, I certainly want to see that panel on women. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I think Philip should be like a play-by-play -play radio announcer. That was really something. Um, so there are a couple, a uh, couple folks, people who asked in the Zoom chat who are Welcome to sort of pipe in with comments, questions, uh, little rebuttals, requests for clarification, or what have you, um, as we go along. Uh, but I will open it up for questions at the end. Um, I've given, as I mentioned, I think on Twitter, I've, I've now given this talk twice before. So I'm especially excited to get some feedback and to maybe walk through it in a little bit of a slower and looser fashion than I did the first couple of times. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about how it came to be. Uh, and for that, I have to thank Will Roberts. Um, wonderful guy. Sorry he couldn't make it today, but he has uh, <laughs> he has already seen this um, and uh, served as a, a very, very capable workshop organizer and discussant. So I, I probably wouldn't have subjected him to it a second time in full anyway. Um, in a nutshell, uh, I, I was off to Montreal to present, to give a paper at a different conference um, on, on some really, really dry, like metaphysics of social kinds type stuff. And Will was like, hey, if you're here, maybe we should get together and do a little workshop for the department people at McGill. And I had an incredible time. Uh, it was amazingly productive. Um, I, I took up some material from the book project, sort of jammed together uh, two and a half chapters, one of which is uh, in an article form uh, forthcoming somewhere else, other one of which is still under review. And I was like, well, maybe I can put this together into a package. We can pre-distribute it. Um, and we'll get some good responses from the folks at McGill. And so uh, I absolutely did. Uh, and uh, because I already had this to hand, the very gracious Red May organizers said, um, you know, shame, shame we weren't there. 
uh, would, you, would you want to run this back for us um, in Seattle or uh, digital Seattle, which I guess is um, the, the permanent location of this conference? Uh, and so I, I was like, absolutely. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so I'll warn you before we get into the thick of it that this is a, some some of the edges here are a little bit rough um, because it was written on reasonably short notice for uh, a sort of rough cut workshop. And so I would encourage you all, uh, if, if you ever feel like, you know, polemicizing against or, or taking up or um, circulating, citing anything in this uh, to just, just sort of uh, give me a holler and maybe I can send you some more finished stuff if you like. Uh, but other than that, it should be a lot of fun circulating with you all. And as I said, I, I'm really excited for the feedback, comments, questions, rebuttals, and so on. Um, uh, it goes pretty briskly. Uh, and probably there will be things that we don't get very much time for. Um, so feel free to ask questions, ask me to expand on whatever. Um, all right, so I'm going to uh, read a sort of abridged version of this, maybe stop and explain a couple of the thornier passages or give background. Um, it was written for an audience of political theorists primarily and philosophers, um, which explains that that unwieldy, almost grotesque title that Philip was having such a fun time with. Um, and so there are parts that are a little inside baseball. Um, and then also it's not written presuming that you are a Marx person. Um, so I, I might jump over the more remedial Marx sections and probably there are some Marx claims in here that y'all will have fun with, but uh, Marx, not really written for Marx people, not really the big point. So with that, with that preface, uh, I'll take it away. So as I said, this, this workshop paper was written for uh, a workshop convened by Will Roberts at McGill University. And I wanna thank him again, not only for having suggested this before his really accomplished scholarship, which has served as a consistent source of inspiration as I've attempted to hack away on what may well seem from the outside like a, a rather idiosyncratic set of problems. And of course, I'd like to thank you all for having taken the time to be here today. Um, and I am really look for, looking forward to your thoughts and questions. So this, as I said, in his attempt to add and break de novo, a pretty unwieldy book project into a core set of arguments, hopefully discussable and debatable before a mixed audience. And so again, I apologize for any rough edges, marginal remarks. Most of the material herein has been presented only separately and the argumentative cartilage bringing these arguments together is what at times sort of gets left out of this picture a little bit. And so for these reasons, I've, I've erred on the side of rendering these arguments a bit less technical and perhaps more didactic than strictly necessary. And I've left out a lot of the discussion of the literature, save Will Roberts's work. And so his, his work is going to be our anchor here as we get into it, um, because he convened the, the workshop. And I figure if we're gonna pick one reference point to situate ourselves in the literature, it, it should be his really exceptional work. Um, so. A few decades after it seemed near more abundant amidst the collapse of the Soviet Union, Anglophone reception of Marx's work has certainly reached a new high watermark. The work of the past several decades has particularly benefited from the belated English language uptake of German language Marx reception. And I have in here particularly the work of Backhaus, Lundfeld, Brentel, Heinrich, Krau, Mao, Postona, and Reichelt, um, which alongside the work of English post Althusserians, the you know, 70s rediscovery of early Soviet theorists driven of Pashukhanis, and the sort of long chain descendants of the Marxist humanist tradition, I've been taken collectively to embody a tradition of Marx reading referred to generically as value form theory. So the value form school, taking its name from an appendix to capital entitled the value form, can be loosely distinguished from other traditions of Anglophone Marx interpretation by its focus on value as a social relation, and what generalized commodity production qua generalized form of production for value might have to say to treatment of social relations in general. And so more to the point, we might distinguish it uh, by a comparative disinterest in the topics to which Marx was strip mined by the post-war Anglophone interpreters, uh, whom even where they read Marx normatively, due to these very distributional arguments, 
as was in the cases of uh, Romer, Wolf, Krzyworski, Bowles, Gintis, Wright. And so the value form accounts in shedding light on capitalist relations somewhere closer to the terrain of Marx's ideal average, render these distributional concerns altogether beside the point. Because the ability of the liberal egalitarian tradition and political theory to pose and proffer solutions to distributional concerns while taking thorough growing markets as an incontestable necessity is, of course, by the same stroke, a demonstration of why these distributional concerns can't be those of Marx. Instead, this tradition held to begin that generalized commodity production is characterized by a few ostensibly mutually necessary conditions, um, those being wage labor, production for value, and so on, and concerned itself with what might be said analytically from these conditions alone. And insofar as Marx was a communist, he believed himself to have an ultimately compelling account of how, barring concerns of distribution and stability, generalized commodity production is necessarily worthy of supersession by communism. And this is for the simple reason that these concerns are directly downstream of what it means to mediate social decisions by way of money and markets, you know, rather than some unjust distribution of initial endowments, sedimented inequality, etc. So where this value form tradition might read Marx in the service of something like political theory, it sidesteps these complaints of fairness, inequality, and so on. As these issues are, like liberal political theorists will inform you, addressable within capitalism with, for instance, like transfer and distribution branches and roles, they can't be the normative issues which would motivate Marx and readers of capital to a thoroughgoing communism. And after Roberts, we might say to the same effect that a reading of Capital Volume 1, as what he calls a political speech act, allows us to claim that much of what Marx understood himself to be doing was asserting the irreducibility of certain features from that picture, namely money and wage labor to which his contemporaries often assigned blame, which had the effect of serving as a powerful critique of reformisms and rival contemporary utopian socialisms. You, you know the drill. It isn't one bad feature which must go. It's the whole arrangement. You can't discard one of these features without discarding the whole plot. And you can think here of something like Marx's arguments on the fair wage. So although this is a, a fairly simplifying revisionary history, It'll serve for our purposes here. Here, all I wish to do is to underscore that the schools of Marx reception, which I'm reading together here, read Marx as providing in capital a noun sense of what's wrong with the rule of capital. And these schools describe specifically what's wrong as social domination, impersonal domination, abstract social domination, although what they mean by this varies from a very generic use of domination in the sense of hair shops, to more specific uses of domination by Skinner, Pettit, Lovett, and others, working in the tradition, for instance, of Anglo-American you know, republicanism. Um, I think there might be important similarities between these domination complaints, especially the more generic kind, and complaints of alienation and ratification made by these readers' forebears, although I, I, I don't have space to make this clear. So Marx himself does not use domination in a particularly technical sense. And correspondingly, most of the work in this literature doesn't attempt to show the correspondence of the phenomenon they read off generalized commodity production as domination to any particular conception of domination in the literature. Uh, and I follow Roberts in finding this vagueness a little bit problematic. So the formal side of this argument is of dubious value without a delineated concept of domination. And the political theoretic side doesn't really get off the ground should the reader lack agreement on the morally weighty nature of the conception of domination which is to be employed and agreement that there exists a competing course of action. Here, communism would, you know, lessen the phenomenon cited. And so, you know, Roberts addresses exactly this problem in Marx's Inferno and attempting to specifically embed a reading of capital somewhere in the lineage of the value form in Pettit's concept of domination. And we obtain at the end of, of Roberts's analysis the dictum that the content of socialism is seen to be the universalization of Republican freedom. Um, and I, although I don't use it as a departure point here, I would take as the other exemplar of a, a recent work, more or less in this vein, addressing the same ambiguity to be uh, Soren Mao's excellent neat compulsion. However, in spite of the very real accomplishments of Robert's project, I want to argue that there remain two interesting lacunae here on which to work. And the first is in part a stylistic one. Roberts accomplishes an admirable reading of capital, 
Um, but I believe there remains some work to be done in the task of addressing these arguments at the level of their conceptual rudiments to political philosophers and theorists. And Robert says quite cleanly that the mechanisms by which a competitive market affects the decision making of everyone who enters it to sell their products constitutes domination insofar as they expose all those who enter the market to uncertainty, which is akin to something like Pettit's claim that the, of the particular psychologistic harms of being subject to the arbitrarium of another. And it renders all a slave to decisions of others insofar as preferences of others impose themselves without any need to justify themselves and without any possibility of being contested. And that there is a, a quote from Will Roberts. And so I'd like to experiment in making an argument much along those lines, along the lines of something like uh, a sort of atomic commodity relationships harms, uh, or those of the aforementioned Neue Marx sector scholars, but with fairly minimal reference to the specific conceptual apparatus of capital. And I believe this argument is at least partially separable from the main of the project. And I, I hope by the separation, we're able to both address it to the broader political theoretic tradition. So as to say to those, you know, domination theorists, and there are a lot of these guys, uh, non-Marxian or, or quasi-Marxian domination theorists debating whether capitalist domination is better ameliorated by a universal basic income or a job guarantee. And the outcome they seek is only realized by the abolition of wage labor. Should we encounter disagreement, recapitulating the argument from less will make clearer on which specific properties of markets, money, domination, and so on we disagree. Uh, and I'll add as an addendum here that I think uh, separating out something like an argument with political theoretic ramifications from something like the, the theory as a whole, the work as a whole, actually has the benefit of improving the way in which historically, critically, we're able to read the work as a whole. Um, I, I, I hope that it, it both helps out those in allied political theoretic disciplines and makes reading Marx a little bit less weighty, something that we can really take all of our best historical chops to. Um, so uh, I'll admit as well, uh, although I'm not going to elaborate here, that while I'm agreed on the sort of profound, you know, base wrongness of capitalist social arrangements, I'm not altogether convinced by the core normative arguments of the neo-Republican project. Domination as a distinct harm from interference, non-domination as an intrinsic or primary good, and so on. Um, but, but this work of explicitly exposing the interface between the descriptive and normative components here, while constructing the descriptive so as to provide us with something at the end of the day that we might later find normatively salient, allows the same descriptive arguments to be addressable to different normative foundations. What I mean by that here is if we move in the direction of something like um, saying in, in reading capital non-normatively, we say Marx finds this to be a problem, but he's not interested in articulating in a, in a prima facie moral fashion why this is a problem. We, we can still have an argument that shows downstream of, for instance, uh, the commodity continued abs con considered abstractly and the things necessary for it to be conceptually coherent, we obtain something like a set of rules, covering laws, and so on, which will lead us down the road to say that if we find this, this, and that to be profoundly wrong, profoundly bad, which is not something we have to argue to make this sort of analytical claim. Uh, just we can have this analytical claim and we can address it to uh, your gut intuitions, to my feeling of injustice or, or what have you, right? Uh, and, and I'm not concerned to argue that Marx really wants to recapitulate this, this thick sketch along these lines here. So the second lacuna, is a little bit of a subtler one. And its validity as a concern, I think, remains to be demonstrated over the course of the paper. It is the lack of demonstration of the existence uh, of any possible institutional arrangement, which would satisfy something like the above complaint. 
which would best generalize commodity production according to the normative grounds on which we find the above complaint salient while meeting a set of pre-existing desiderata, for instance, with regard to the provision of certain needs. Uh, and if you're a sort of mainstream political theorist here, you can talk about primary goods, Pareto improvement, and so on. So the market in the context of what Roberts calls the exposure of decisions to market forces uh, does an immense amount of work in making the gamut of social decisions possible. Uh, the story of the pencil, you know, this commonplace in apologetics for capitalism is, is for real. It's like Hegelian reconciliation is reinvented by Austrian economists. And I saw someone say in the chat, how does Hegel fit in? He doesn't really. This is just sort of a cheeky remark. And in the story of the countless intermediate goods and distribution processes and pricing processes at each step of the way mediated by money and in the ultimate outcome of cheap and plentiful goods, we're supposed to see something like nothing other than joy and the miracle of market dependence. Uh, there's something faintly miraculous about it all. Through individual avarice, we're supposed to somehow manage a Pareto optimal means of coordinating production and schematically marketize social action. And the analogy to uh, Hegelian reconciliation here is something like what Hegel means when he talks about the actual and the rational. Um, it, it, it's through appreciating uh, it's through appreciating the conditions of our dependence, uh, the limits of our freedom that we actually come to appreciate how we are free. Um, so many would opine axiomatically, we can't do better, and domination theorists would have us over minimize domination rather than entirely nullify it. And so there's, there's a pretty extensive literature, uh, and I'm adding this to the sidebar here. Uh, if you go out and look of people who talk about domination and socialism, domination in the workplace, domination in markets, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a hot thing in philosophy for a second. Most of these guys, effectively none of these guys, are actually content to make this a point about markets and money in general. Uh, they talk about dependence on the boss. They talk about dependence on the wage. You get a lot of stuff that's sort of analogous to new compulsion. Uh, but their, their basic concerns are they're interested in uh, remedying this through making possible something like exit from this arrangement reducing your dependence on this arrangement by offering you a universal basic in income, um, worker-managed firms, and so on, right? And uh, we don't think that this is going to be satisfactory if we're on board with the project of, of Capital Volume 1. So anyway, is the result of this process of market mediation, in fact, arbitrary, non-rule governed? And this is supposed to be what makes something, what makes power over someone arbitrary and thus domination rather than just power. Is it characterized by deliberative isolation? Is the exercise of market power unfettered by the input of those thereby affected? And ultimately, were the social technology of the market to dominate us, would this be sufficient normative grounds to find against it? Can we be assured of a means of mediating the same kinds of social decisions that ultimately decisively leaves us better by whatever normative standard we want to claim here? And so this is all to say. We're looking for an argument that proceeds analytically from certain logically necessary features of generalized commodity production upon which we can agree, and furnishes the basis for a critique of commodity production wherein this property is not only shown to be necessary of commodity production, but also shown to be obviated by some other scheme of institutional arrangements. And I, I'm going to sidebar here. The crucial difference between this and something like recipes for the cookshops of the future is that here we're not filling in determinate content of what one ought to do. We're merely attempting to render this claim salient by showing that there is, that there exists something that does better, right? It's like a, it's like an existence proof. Uh, it's not a prescription. These are, these are fundamentally somewhat different classes. So anyway, this sort of contrarian project would if so facto mount, if so facto mount an argument against capitalism, which even the most egalitarian-minded social democrat or whomever you talk to would concede renders their ideal theoretic institutional arrangements unsatisfactory. And so the simple question is that motivates this sort of inquiry here is if we Marxologists have this argument to have to hand, why don't liberal political theorists, why don't everyone else, why aren't they aware of this kind of 
atomic harm, which is always and necessarily present in generalized commodity production at even the most abstract level. So Marxists working on the 20th century revival of neo-Ricardian economics often referred to, with whatever accuracy to what they called the fundamental Marxian theorem, uh, a theorem derivable from the formal structure of Marx's quantitative value theory, which served as a kind of basis for mounting distributional arguments against mainstream marginal economics, as well as a kind of check of the ostensible fidelity to Marx of any particular formalism of economic activity in terms of production function matrices. And so, well, this particular theorem, basically picking out something like the accounting identity, that positive profits require positive surplus labor, has little to do with our uh, purposes here. In another sense, we're after something kind of meta-argumentatively similar. We're, we're looking for a reading of Marx that furnishes a theorem, preferably an epistemically lightweight one, which demonstrates that generalized commodity production necessarily and in every case entails some normatively salient consequence. And so this theorem is gonna look something like our two-part desideratum above, a lemma analytically proving something of generalized commodity production and opening up into a normative component. Apropos of the extensive debate on, in political theory on Marx and morality, we can observe this sidesteps the grounds of the debate. In Holden, as did alone in the players among that big 70s Marx and morality debate, who saw me that Marx found something normatively objectionable about capitalism, as follows from his having labored to overturn it, and yet also that the argument of capital, or at least one of the arguments made therein, is not an explicitly normative project, we're free to show what entails from some concepts of classical political economy and to leave the particular normative embedding of this lemma to the reader. As may be plausibly argued, Marx had a substantive normative complaint, but arguing on normative grounds specifically is not among the core argument of attempts to capital. For Marx, the specific normative salience of the features of capitalism he describes are, once the description is accounted for, completely obvious, you know. Marx doesn't think you need to explain why to find this concrete capitalist social phenomenon of abhorrent. It just is for him. So at the stage of reconstructing this theorem from Marx, we'll seek to arrive at a conclusion which would be normatively salient for our interlocutors, those who aren't yet on board, without arguing for the normative grounding itself. The first question is, what resources do we have in capital to mount such a group? Capital famously begins with the commodity. And here we're going to commence from a minimal, fairly revisionary sketch of an abstracted commodity, as well as several of the properties we believe to be required for its conceptual co coherence. Uh, I'm going to jump over some of the more granular parts of this treatment so we can get to the more interesting stuff. I'm going to talk about value specifically. Uh, famously, Marx's stipulation of the commodity has value. Uh, I think what the way we ought to treat a commodity having value here uh, is effectively, I'm just going to start by treating it as a kind of predicate. You know, X has value. Value, which uh, Marx states, and, and <laughs> here people might find some of the finer details of this argument contentious value, which is necessarily measurable in money terms, is equivalent to the socially necessary labor time required to produce the commodity at hand. Socially necessary labor time itself not being expressible in temporal units before the mediation by money in the market of heterogeneous labors and production processes. And I, I, mean, I, I don't mean temporally prior here. Value under some restricted conditions accounts for the rates at which various commodities are to be exchanged, right? And so following, for instance, the labors of the neo-Ricardians to provide some formal clarity to Marx's apparatus, we can also show good enough equivalence between values and prices of production. Uh, and so more or less, you can say the ratio of two values is the ratio at which two commodities are to exchange under certain conditions. Um, and these conditions are a little more restrictive than either the Marxists and neo-Ricardians will tell you. Um, in order to make this argument work formally, you need perfect competition you need it works out to perfect information, you need no non-convexities and so on. Um, but to say that this ratio, this, to say this ratio of two values is the ratio at which two particular commodities are to exchange under these conditions 
is also to pick out the respective shares of the aggregate social products, which production of each commodity represents. So the, as I said, the majority of the formal stipulations about the commodity are surplus to the requirements for constructing our argument here. Um, we've got, what we're focusing on here is value as a predicable, flexible in dollar terms, which we may hold to be an objective property of the commodities which are said to have it. And this is not at this point to specify uh, any sort of relationship between subjective valuation and value, right? So value uh, is unlike most of the other predicables with which we're acquainted uh, because of its spectrality. Value, although being an objective property, is not itself an object swirling itself away in commodities. You know, the true proposition P that Joe's car is worth $10,000 could become false without any property of the car observable through sense perception changes. So were, for instance, the technological process of car manufacture to drastically change and render new cars with this model of car in your cost list, uh, the value of the car would obviously change. A particular specimen of a commodity, right, which might validly be said to be extraordinarily valuable, like a, a photolithography machine used to make advanced semiconductors, would shed the entirety of its value where it transported back to like King Arthur's court, right? <laughs> um, I, I want to say, and this is a, a pretty cheeky footnote here, but I'll leave it in anyway. Along these lines, I really would contend debates about where value is created expose themselves as pretty fundamentally meaningless. Uh, it's not an object, it's a property. Um, and it's, it's a little bit akin to talking about where something like the redness of roses is created. Through what place and process apart from the creation of roses and the process, whether you want to talk about that in terms of social conferral, sense perception, you know, we can be like naive color realists if we want, which lead roses to be red at all. Um, so nevertheless, we may say in this account that value remains objective rather than subjective, simply because the value of a particular commodity is obviously subject independent. To recapitulate, what it means to say the value of a particular commodity such and such is precisely to say that under certain formal conditions, the good is exchangeable for this amount. Under these conditions, the ratios of their values dictates it's so fact the ratios at which all other commodities are exchangeable. And so it's actually this set of facts about a commodity's relative exchangeability under these certain formal conditions, which is what would make true any particular proposition about a commodity's value. Um, and so it might seem particular that a property of an object about which we're concerned is the fact that its relative exchangeability under certain conditions by no means guaranteed to be satisfied, right? It sounds a little bit akin to that surly in formulation of social constitution. X counts as Y and C, but instead of telling us what this object counts as in the actual context, we're instead talking about what it would count as in a context which we may not well have seen and which we're not even guaranteed to see. Commodity X would count as, you know, Y1 linen, Y2 tires, and so on in these conditions. And there are plenty, though, of latent conditional properties to be had. And, you know, by means of a requisite number of latent conditional properties, we could polish off the question of emergence once and for all, right? I could just specify. I can, I can specify the behavior uh, of any object under any conditions by just stipulating as a property the fact of its behavior, the fact of what it counts as in this, this, and that hypothetical condition. So what could be the significance of this conditional property in particular? And the answer has to do with the nature of these conditions. Conditions C, the conditions at which, where all goods would exchange their values and have value key prices, which again is not supposed to be, uh, it's not supposed to represent any sort of actual condition, represent the conditions of optimal reproduction of the social surplus. We could say in these sort of neo cardian terms, we could say more or less they represent the conditions of equilibrium. Uh, and I, I'm, no, I'm noting here that I'm reading together something like equilibrium, uh, something like optimal reproduction of social surplus, and something like a more formal general equilibrium here. And there are salient differences. I actually think the most salient difference for our purposes is actually the treatment of the theory of the firm, as well as completeness of markets. 
and maybe the handling of cases of joint reproduction. Um, so, you know, I, a little bit of a sidebar, but famously in general equilibrium, uh, we have a sort of issue with theory of firms stemming from the fact that firms, there's no profit to be had, whereas uh, you don't really have a satisfactory solution in cases of joint reproduction in either the sort of neo-Marxian or neo ricardian formulation of this. But schematically, the difference between these cases is not going to be important. This is basically just to say the set of prices where commodities would have value prices corresponding to their values would be the set of prices which would maximize the reproduction of value. And the ramifications of this point become sharper when we turn to a discussion of practical reason. So practically speaking, when we engage in social action to do with commodities, we're engaged in buying or selling. From a set of price commodities, we choose to buy or not buy, and out of the quantities, we set prices and production levels for the commodities we produce. In everyday life as proletarians, the commodities we choose to buy or not buy are principally consumer goods, and the commodities we choose to price set and choose to sell or not sell are units of labor power. For firms, we also need to think of the purchase of intermediary goods, we have more laxity in price setting, and so on. This social action to do with commodities might sound prescribed and it's described so deeply, but it's really not, right? The costs and payoffs of most social actions are downstream of the prices of commodities. So our decisions to work or not work classically fall under this schema uh, into something like your, uh, your bourgeois economist, you weigh the utility of our wages against the variable levels of disutility we get from various sorts of work and pick an optimal job to perform and so on, right? Um, this holds for our means of obtaining subsistence as a matter of course. Right? More to the point, most of the choices we face in most domains of life are choices we must weigh, at least in part, on the grounds of costs and payoffs downstream of the mediation of money and the market. And our decisions to buy and sell at given prices aren't as arbitrary as all that. So when we're deciding to buy and sell at particular price points, you know, we have nominal freedom. Should I find myself in the position of running a car factory and I declare my cars to sell for vastly less than their value, I won't just be lampooned, I'll go bankrupt. Should I, as a, a consumer, decide that I'll pay, you know, 50 cents per gallon for gasoline, uh, you know, I can post a request for proposal in the fashion of a government contractor, but I'm not very likely to get any bids. Uh, and I'm not going to have a lot of luck levying this offer in person to nearby gas stations. And so as a producer, I might have some leeway to deviate from the level at which my commodities would exchange in condition C, but my, my rope isn't really all that long. And failures to adapt as values change with technological changes of production processes and so on, ultimately culminate in proletarianization in the long run. And so I'm going to henceforth refer to the decision to buy or sell at value at ratios prices, which the given commodities would exchange at in condition C, as the market rational decision. Um, I, I'm stipulating market rationality here. This might sound a little bit awkward to the more Marxy audience. I, I, I got a little pushback from a couple of the political theorists to whom this was originally presented um, because it was the question is, you know, are you taking up an existing sketch of market rationality? I, I'm, I'm effectively, I'm stipulating it in a formal way and a little bit of the formal machinery is concealed here, specifically in the hopes that, uh, you know, you see, you see the phrase market rationality thrown around. You don't really have a good sketch, formal sketch of what it means to fill in the content. So again, catchy phrase for stipulation here. So more formally market rationality will consist of the choice of what we will refer to as the value optimal option from a set of options characterized by a value payoff. And so these options are choices to buy or sell various commodities, again, under the assumption of buying a commodity entails its use and less consumption and production. Choice of the value optimal option is not only optimal from the standpoint of maximization of values, but in the long run necessary in order to ensure the continuation of the agent being in a position to make future choices. And this is because it's a prerequisite for the agent to be able to make decisions from the standpoint of market rationality, that they be in a position to either buy or sell from other agents. And failure to choose the value optimal option from under conditions of competition, ensures a loss, 
And in the long run, continued losses will exhaust the stock of money required to purchase new commodities in order to begin the next instance of the production process and so on. Without this money, the agent loses the ability to buy and is such the ability to produce and is such the ability to sell. And so they have no choices at all from the standpoint of market rationality because no activity in which they can engage at this point will be productive of value. So to recapitulate, where a particular decision consists of the choice to buy or sell a commodity at a particular price, we're in the long run compelled to do so at a particular price level. That price level is the market rational level and is the level which represents the greatest self-expansion of value. And not only is this result wide sweeping in, ter in terms of the set of social decisions to which it's to apply, uh, it actively furnishes the basis of a challenge to critics of marketization, right? It seems like the maximal expansion of value, the maximal expansion of social surplus here, the fullest development of the productive forces, however you prefer to put it, uh, it seems like we couldn't possibly pose better trade-offs than those the social technology the market has given us. And so to recenter domination for a second in the picture, it's certainly the case that there's a form of power being exercised over our choice set. The payoffs of the choices on which we're to decide are not only affected, but almost wholesale constituted by value. And we're taking value here to be a generic for the entirety of the system of money markets and so on, just schematically in that bit right there. But the satisfaction of the other conditions which we take as necessary for sort of power to be domination, and thus sort of automatically morally problem, appear quite a bit more ambiguous. Domination is not only power over choices, but power that in various conceptions is subject only to the arbitrary will of the dominator in the sense of not being rule governed, fails to track the interests of the dominated, or is discursively isolated, whose exercise is not involved those dominated. And so the power we want to say that value as such exercises over choices is a rule governed in a fairly conventional sense. It ostensibly succeeds with flying colors at tracking interests and is actually supposed to do so with Pareto optimality and is infinitely sensitive to perturbations of, of demand slash supply at the behest of those who would be dominated. So we're in sort of an awkward place here, attempting to make the strong case for this as domination in the formal sense in which people take up the concept. Granted, it's not immediately clear that the judgments made by value as to how one ought to act in particular social situations, those which in practice exclude other choices are practically contestable at the level of the individual, but in a certain light, social democracy in the Polanyian sense amounts to a mechanism for such contestation. And so I'll know also that non-contestation is neither necessary nor sufficient for a form of power to be domination in the literature. Although Pettit suggests contestation as a practical means of reducing domination in many cases. Value makes certain judgments that may dictate the trade-offs within some set of choices. Upon occasion, we believe these judgments may err, where these judgments err, the democratic polity votes on some remedy, perhaps a subsidy or syntax is needed, perhaps this sphere of social life ought to be removed from the market entirely, you know, cases of repugnance and so on. And so these are the cases in which the extant literature in the philosophy of markets trades. We sort the truly incommensurable cases from the commensurable enough ones, and we sniff cases until we arrive at the truly repugnant. Not a lot has changed between Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. We find ourselves alternating between the hat we put on when we go to the market as a bearer of a particular commodity, and the hat we wear when we're going to vote on referenda, sort of tempering the market around the edges. While domination and chewing from capitalism is not, is certainly not off the table, and the fault may lie with the formal nature of the conceptions of domination present in the neo-Republican literature, we're having some trouble at this stage of the argument, establishing that this sort of market mediation is in every instance, or even really any instance, domination. The motivation for this is likely downstream of the desire of neo Republicans to render certain types of interfering choice weight modification non problematic. Uh, Pettit, you know, after uh, classical Republicans, repeats ad nauseum that good laws don't reduce, but rather increase the scope of freedom. My mediating what you can and can't do is not ipso facto supposed to reduce the scope of your freedom and pose a problem so long as I'm doing so in certain ways we think are going to be just, non-problematic, and so on, right? We're, we're always interfering with each other's lives. 
And so this is supposed to be the basis of what allows us to specify that that domination is different from just acting and thus interfering in general. And so in the same sense, market mediation here starts to look pretty dangerously close to something like a, a kind of inoffensive state policy. In contrast, more concrete dilemmas within the workplace, wherein the means of subsistence are at risk that ensue from the marketization of society, appear better candidates for neo-Republican domination. What Mao calls the sort of mute compulsion obliging one to work, quite possibly under morally objectionable conditions, is fairly analogous to the situation of domination treated by folks like Alex Gorovich. Republican theorists from you know, the liberal love it to the more self-consciously neoliberal Taylor are for this reason basically always content to recommend some level of universal basic income above subsistence. So as to create the choice of exit, not only from any particular relation of employment, but even from employment simplicity. But again, this more concrete case of domination is a poor candidate for angry care. Because it's not only addressable by social democratic reform, this is a reform actively being proposed right, by liberal and neoliberal self-identified reformists. And so I suggest for a second, momentarily suspending our interest in immediately identifying value mediation as such with domination of this section. We're gonna get back to it later in the argument. Our second line of attack is going to be through the second rationale given in Roberts's work for the unacceptability of domination itself, insofar as it's an entrenched, um, aside from identification of this mediation with the thick concept of domination. The identification with domination itself, insofar as domination is to be an intrinsic bad, supplying the whole of the critique to this effect. That is, and this is what Robert says, that individuals cannot get together and talk about what sorts of things that should be and not, should not be done, and what sort of reasons should and should not count as good reasons. This is to say, individuals which they could collectively form judgments on what trade-offs would be made in various sorts of social decisions, and they're unable to do so because the market makes them for them, ignoring in this span of argument the aforementioned existence of democratic institutions, those that I called Polanyi in a second ago, sort of adjusting along the edges. Um, my judgment of what's rational here is different from the market's judgment in a way that's normatively salient. The question is where, if market rationality so effectively maximizes consumer surplus, the production of the things we want and need with respect to the varying degrees with which we want and need them, as well as the relative difficulty of producing them, where would these cases occur? In the economic literature, the canonical exceptions uh, to the optimality of values judgment are called market failures, and they're treated as essentially exceptional cases. In the classic treatment that of Wolf, you know, they're taxonomized along four lines. Those being public goods and externalities, increasing returns slash non-convexities more broadly, incomplete markets, and distributional inequality. And so to uh, briefly recap those for y'all, uh, the first one is where the decision to buy or sell a commodity at a given price in fact, may have an effect on someone not party to the contract of buying or selling. Uh, the second kind, increasing returns, non convexities is irrelevant for our purposes, although I mentioned it is a problem for these sort of formal, like linear algebraic formulations of Marx. Uh, the third, uh, incomplete markets, is the fairly demanding condition of completeness of markets, not only for producible goods, but for ever increasingly ornate contracts upon these goods futures markets, options markets, and so on. And the, the fourth is distributional inequality is self-explanatory. But none of these, which is interesting, none of these four sort of canonical cases of market failure have faced particularly extensive treatment in the Marxian literature as ways in which generalized commodity production is supposed to, to do ill, to fail. You know, instead, you, you hear quite a lot about the ostensible antinomy between production for use slash production for need and production for value slash production for profit. You hear about the sense in which generalized commodity production doesn't abet human flourishing. And we hear about how the free association of communism brings about full and free development. Is there a connection between these approaches 
or are our objections not addressable from the terrain of judging desired outcomes? So this is going to be uh, a pretty tendentious bit. Effectively, what I'm going to attempt to do here to try to provide a little additional clarification, because it moves pretty quickly and I got a couple questions, is show uh, if you take up uh, this Marxian reading in a particular light, you wind up with a couple of cases of market failures, which ultimately lead you to completely find against the suitability of markets for and in any and all cases. And I think there's going to be a funny way in which these three sets of market failures, which I'm going to propose, um, which are principally, uh, some of them are subsumable under the former taxonomy. One of them's novel. Uh, I think together is they're going to kind of recapitulate in a, in a sort of fun way. Uh, a lot of the complaints with generalized commodity production at the level of logical necessity, at the terrain of the ideal average, which we find sort of problematic, which we find to pose uh, a, a real sort of like hitch for us in finding ourselves okay with the mediation of money and markets generically. So I'm gonna argue here for three subcategories of market failures which haven't been treated uh, in the public choice literature before, but which together I claim apply to all social action mediated by value. And so I believe considered together that these uh, three subcategories of market failure capture what it means to be for there a divergence between production for need and production for value, as well, what it, as well as what it means to say that generalized commodity production stunts full and free development, in that these three subcategories of market failure are assimilable to the language uh, of mainstream political theory, economics, and so on, but not ultimately soluble within their conceptual categories, within a, a structure of mediation of social decision by value. Um, and I will, I will say here, uh, sort of briskly, that production for use, production for need, I'm not making the strong claim that this is the principal maxim with, with which Marx is concerned. Certainly his focus on it is pretty marginal. We never really get a full sketch of it from him. We don't even really get a, a particularly full sketch of need or use or need use utility. Uh, the latter two of which he uses basically interchangeably and the, the pretty limited deployment of them in the first volume. Um, so I think to the extent that you can attribute something like this position to Marx, the sort of taking need seriously position, uh, it's going to be a little bit of reading Marx against Marx. Um, so the first of these three subcategories is the simplest. Uh, it's that of a heretofore unmentioned variety of incomplete markets. So while there's been extensive discussion on the subject of free time under capitalism, and so, you know, while of course we're not living in the world of Keynes's rhapsodic predictions, working time has declined fairly consistently in the core economies over the past half century. And the, there's also been extensive discussion of the viability of choosing to work fewer hours than customary in accordance with declining marginal utility of income. Uh, there's been quite a lot arguing that we're systematically missing markets for a broad set of varieties of work. And so this sort of sketch here is going to say what it means to be a fully developed and flourishing person likely entails the opportunity to pursue multiple forms of activity, both at different points throughout a life as well as simultaneously. It may well be the case that given I had a, you know, a childhood wish to, to heal folks, what it would mean for me to be fully realized, possessed as I am of a law degree, is the opportunity to do something like help out with hospital rounds from time to time, albeit without an 80 hour per week commitment. It might be like uh, the, the sort of truck, truck driving simulator purchasers. Uh, I would want to unwind with something like this every now and then. But effectively, uh, the sort of classical framing of decisions to take particular jobs is in terms of the relationship between the utility of, from income against the disutility from work. But not all jobs are alike, of course. It's somewhat of a commonplace that meaningfully different work conditions would render work no longer an object of disutility, but perhaps eventually something like life's product. 
But there's no reason for labor markets to feature not only the market for the predominant way of performing a job, but also a vast set of alternate labor processes for similar tasks, ranging around the means, you know, perhaps archaic or less hyper-specialized in performing this task, the number of hours, you know, requiring employers to eat the cost of training the, the future communist dilettante and so on. Rather, transaction costs and bargaining, as well as the poor availability of capital to the folks <laughs> approaching the bank with a proposal for a business wherein they would produce something in a way other than that, which is market rational, renders the set of markets not only incomplete, uh, but it asks people to perform these sort of single life consuming jobs in conditions which not only could be made better, but may well previously have done so. And next, we're going to wind up with another Marxian complaint recapitulated in this schema here as a case of non substitutability. This is the case of demand for goods and services, where in a property of the good or service is that it's not exchanged for money. And this might sound trivial, but it's actually surprisingly broad. A prospective patient of a therapist might well harbor a desire for something like psychological care, but divorced from commodity relations. Paying therapist, you know, produces pressure against any kind of behavior that might cause offense. It forces the therapist into this role of debt collector put on, to put on that character mask. It creates a feeling of not being meaningfully cared for. Yet, there definitionally can't be a market for a commodity that's not exchanged for money. It's a contradiction in terms. So this is a case of a market that should exist, or at least, you know, something like your, your mainstream liberal economist would think that it should, but it can't, does it? And so this good is also, at the same time, going to be a case of a good underproduced, um, a good that would have something like, quote, end quote, positive externality. Um, and of course, the reason is, uh, effectively what this means formally, is just that something like the, the socially best level of production of this good would be significantly higher than the level that we have. So in the case of something like therapy, it's not technically going to be a public good because it's excludable and rivalrous. Uh, and strictly speaking, there aren't really externalities at all, insofar as they're definitionally can't be a contract of buying or selling this good. For what it means to be for a good to be the sort of good that's not produced by the market is that there are no market incentives to produce it. And as there's meaningful desire for it, uh, provision of this is something that systematically necessarily cannot, is not going to happen under generalized commodity production. So this is so we straddle here uh, two of these sort of classic categories in political theory, the public choice literature. Uh, bringing together something like a market failures case and an externalities. Uh, it's the intersection between market failures on the grounds of incompleteness and market failures on the grounds of externalities. And so finally, um, we get back to the classic case of market failures on the grounds of externalities. And this is going to be a concept that you hear people attribute to Pigou, although in fact the word was never uttered by him. A paradigmatic example, of course, would be something like pollution, right? I've bought a coal plant and I can choose to produce electricity by means of coal generation as I wish. It's profitable for me because the price of coal is very low, and yet I'm severely adversely affecting both the physical health of my immediate neighbors and the long-term well-being of all those on the planet. As it stands, I'm in fact unable to take into account the interests of these groups without being outcompeted. Doing so in the schema I, I, we gave earlier would not be market rational. And this is the market failure as there's uncaptured loss to consumers, individuals, um, being inflicted in each purchase of a, a new unit of coal power. For which, you know, we would want something like the way we mediate social action to take into account, and yet we can't. We, it, it is impossible for the producer to take this into account. If you take this into account, you will go bust. Uh, the only outcomes in which we come to some positive arrangement would be classically where the government is supposed to impose a Pecubian tax to capture the true social cost of pollution. Or, you know, in the Kosian sense where citizens claim these as of yet unimagined property rights to clean air and they attempt to derive some variety of arrangement by which they'll auction them off to me. 
uh, there's this fantasy. This is like one of the classic um, proofs that you get out of something like the Chicago School of Economics, right? These guys try to show formally that if you give me a, a sufficiently well-specified set of property rights, you know, uh, somehow we all negotiate to ensure that I have the title to X units of breathing, good air and not dying. Um, uh, we can all arrive at the sort of uh, internalized market clearing price if in fact those property rights are specified. Obviously those property rights aren't specified. They can't be specified. They're the cases in which it doesn't make, even make sense to specify them barring sort of political economic conditions here would be cases where transaction costs make this impossible. Um, but anyway, the, there's nothing novel about this case here, right? The externalities case. It's just a simple provocation. A uh, provocation is something like this. When you guys, and, and here, this is effectively addressing uh, liberals, liberal political theorists, economists, all the people who are concerned with something like a better, more just social world, but not something like the abolition of markets. Uh, when we talk about production for need or production for use, do we mean anything other than production according to what would best satisfy the needs and wants of all, as contrasted to the market rational levels of production necessitated by value? And so, however this might be formally stipulated, are you actually confident that it would differ from what it would mean to fully and properly internalize all of these cases? Along these lines, the distinction between this argument and the sort of classic argument uh, is not principally the level of grounding. It's really a distinction of willingness to generalize this argument thoroughly. The communist, in hearing of production for use or production for need, finds these sort of social communal deficiencies uh, in production as measured against these standards and even the most ostensibly unobjectionable market action. It confronts market society effectively with a simple question. Is there such a thing as a social action that only affects two parties, the parties on either side of the contract. Why shouldn't we consider, uh, you know, we, we have all of these other cases of uh, irrash discounting, imperfect information. Um, what social impact aren't we considering when we allow, we have cases that run the gamut from the class of pollution case to something like large cars on the street large cars carrying these increased risks of injuring people, unsustainable agricultural methods which deplete the soil, which hasten antibiotic resistance. When we hold as the object of our inquiry something like the realization of, of human need, of the good for people, we find axiomatically means in which our lives might be better behind every social condition. And so taking this position seriously, which is, is something which is basically absent from the, from the literature, implies bringing about what would, what would realize full and free development or human flourishing insofar as these contribute to something like well-being, the good for people. This position effectively just amounts to the discrepancy between the judgments we would make on the grounds of human welfare and those the market would make. Uh, if the market indeed for these reasons structurally fails to judge in the interests of need, use, the good for people, we've answered the demand for a proof of the preferability of a different scheme for judgment here. And so in summary, I've attempted to formally embed a version of a Marxian critique of generalized commodity production at the level of the ideal average in terms that I think are assimilable to uh, liberal economic discourse, analytic political theory, and so on. And so I'll add as an addendum here, right? Uh, I, I got a, a great question from someone in the audience the first time this talk happened at, at McGill. And the question ran something like this. Um, all right, you know, but uh, effectively, doesn't this mean that you're, that, uh, <laughs> You're, you're you're hoping you know that that this argument be taken up by something like uh, the liberal, the social democrat. I think the specific question was, um, you know, uh, <laughs> isn't this doesn't this boil down to something that I could uh, I could sell like 
I could give to someone not in on the full Marxist project, that I could give to a relative. I think that someone said, you know, that I could find it in an airport bookstore. And, and my, my response there was, um, well, first of all, you should sell the book for me. Um, but, but second of all, um, if in fact uh, this argument in full is sufficient to get the liberal and the social democrat to come along on something like the categorical insufficiency, uh, the categorical uh, failure of markets to mediate social decisions, even at the most sort of basic, you know, ostensibly inoffensive case. Uh, so if liberals and social democrats are coming along with me on that, no markets, no money, uh, I'm already pretty happy with the contours of the conversation. I'm pretty happy with what this intervention is effectively supposed to do. Um, I, I think we're going to have a significantly better discussion if our interlocutors are content to say, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not going to be judging according to markets. So we've obtained a set of schematic ways in which markets by the commonplace account fail. They structurally fail to produce the sorts of work which would be ne necessary to live fully realized lives. They necessarily and logically fail to produce appropriate levels of the kind of good which we demand in an intrinsically non-market mediated form. And the, the con this concept that you hear of sometimes externalities lacks a convincing reason why it ought not be generalized as social action in general. Given all social actions have not gone effect, some parties not captured in either side of the conflict. Our next question is: Can we find accounts of institutional arrangements which would meaningfully address these complaints? So this section gets fairly meaningfully abridged due to space, but as it stands, we're just going to consider very briefly, and you're welcome to ask me to expand on this. Very brief sketches of in natura planning and the programmatic suggestions of the critique of the government. We, we see here, and I, I, I regret sort of picking on the critique of the Gotha program here, having not been intended for publication, it's fragmentary, it's sketchy. So grain of salt, I'm not going to be too mean here, but we see in it, uh, characterized as Marx admits by the first Marx of the old society from whose womb it emerges, only a few meaningful institutions are to comment. The first is in the critique the replacement of wages with labor vouchers, which does not help satisfy any of these above conditions, and absent further clarification, can't be said to yet amount to anything more than a distributional reform, much in line with the awarding of Soviet employees dominate uh, effectively these ceremonial non-marketized salaries. And more concerningly, Marx dictates the same principle prevails as that which regulates the exchange of commodities, as far as this is exchange of equal values. Content and form are changed because under the altered circumstances, no one can give anything except his labor. And because on the other hand, nothing can pass to the ownership of individuals except individual means of consumption. But as far as the distribution of the latter among the individual producers is concerned, the same principle prevails as in the exchange of commodity equivalents. A given amount of labor in one form is exchanged for equal amount of labor in another. In other words, we can confirm that our third condition is necessarily failed insofar as the judgments made on trade-offs in terms of need are necessarily disregarded in favor of those in terms of socially necessary labor time. There are arguments that Marx intended for these judgments to have been replaced with commensurating ratios of concrete labor time expended, but this suggestion is, as Marx notes, actually therein facially incoherent. As labor would seek to function as unit of measurement, more properly socially necessary labor time, we're not able to commensurate heterogeneous labors. The other two points, the other two big picture problems we have are unaddressed. Finally, I'll note that the relevant features of in natura planning for our purposes, as originated in Neurach and, and taken up by some recent literature, are that it plans in units and that it rejects the possibility of calculation between prices. So the former is promising for us. The latter poses somewhat of a problem. Where we lack outright the possibility of calculation between prices, and we face these supposedly, you know, small potatoes, low stakes decisions, we lack a means of putting into the form of trade-offs for the benefit of the allocation for production, the goods for which political contestation is not a likely matter. And so in practice, when asked to make these trade-offs, advocates of industrial planning suggest either the use of these mathematical models that get you back to these shadow prices, and thus judgments of brief payoffs as would have been made by value, 
Or more simply, a few folks have suggested neo Narratian, simply the limited use of the market itself, uh, with the suggestion that relevant goods will be quoted, banned, and so on by the polity. But as I mentioned before, it's exactly the idea that occasional so democratic political pressure or market values is adequate that communists seek to critique in social democracy. This latter, less ambiguous institutional sketch of uh, a, a market to be around the margins, rounded off by the democratic polity, is in fact not only realizable in the present day, but already realized. And so I'll conclude this paper with a highly abbreviated sketch of how to construct the sort of generalizable social decision judgments without markets. I suggest it's necessary to avoid lapsing back into market rationality as a means of deciding between these apparently inconsequential low stakes trade offs. The broader philosophical work necessary to establish this position is largely elsewhere, so I apologize for the curtness. Given the aforementioned resonances between production for me, production for use, well being, I seek your capacious sketch of the basic object of consideration for this production for that being something like need, use, well being, the good, and so on. Need suggests hierarchies along the lines of the capacities approach. Use, which as I mentioned before, is actually used in capital volume one interchangeably with utility, is pretty flat footed uh, without something like, you know, the uh, utilitarian's weird hedonism to fill it in. And something like well-being, welfare is profoundly multivalent in the philosophical literature. I think the sort of prosaic path here is to begin with a semantic analysis of the good, which I suggest should be taken to mean the good for people. And along these lines, living a good life, I will suggest that this is neither an objective nor subjective state, as taxonomies of theories of well-being usually run, but in fact, a judgment made against contextually variable standards, and sensitive to conditions, which the literature calls the shape of a life and so on. The fact of this judgment, how well my life is going for me, uh, is neither objective nor universalizable, doesn't pose a substantive problem, as we wouldn't believe ourselves to be in a position to contest the veridicality of these judgments of, judgments of this sort in any case. Nor, for our purposes, will the shifting and different standards of these judgments pose an issue. Instead, we can look to something like the Katoma approach used to contest the calculation problem. And instead of attempting this iterative adjustment of policies on the basis of whether uh, markets clear, we can attempt to iterate on judgments of how well, meaningfully fulfilling, and so on lives are going. We can obtain information useful in the aggregate as to correlative relationships of various provisional decisions and social institutions to the end without attempting to do something like aggregate preferences or optimize social surplus, which I effectively is, is where these aforementioned approaches get to. The provision decisions on which we would attempt to adjust would be along the lines of something like pre-provision of, of goods in general of this kind. Lotteries for this thing, like housing, this much in demand area and so on. We're interested in the broad institution level arrangement uh, at the level of a particular community. And from this process of adjustment, alongside constant novel attempts by others to experiment with different ways of coordinating social behavior, we obtain a demand factor that approximates welfare by, of course, the estimating the amount of such and such good needed if we have pre provision of it, if there's a particular prerequisite for it to be obtained, you know, if certain people need industrial stand mixers to open their bakeries and so on. And this ensures the concrete judgments used in trade-offs about production reflect something other than optimization of value or social surplus, while by design insulating most from the encroachment of optimization on social actions uh, that would rather remain stubbornly non-optimal. And there we've just about wrapped up the paper. Uh, I'll briefly talk a little bit more about what got left out of that sketch before we move on to further questions. Uh, I don't have the YouTube questions in front of me. Uh, I'm probably going to open it up to folks in the Zoom for some questions first before we go look at those YouTube questions. Um, but uh, yeah, so fuller version of this is available on request, as is stuff like bibliography and so on. Um, and effectively, that latter section is somewhat condensed because it gets a little technical. Uh, and we've also left out here, and you're, and you're welcome to ask questions about something like the kind of basic epistemic grounding 
that lets you set up something like these market rational judgments. Um, yeah, so I, I hope you guys, I hope you all appreciated that. Um, I'm very interested to hear comments, questions, and so on. As I said before, it's it's a little bit wacky because it's attempting to uh, pose to this sort of a uh, big group audience of uh, political theorists, philosophers, and so on. Uh, ultimately, what I think is a, a pretty necessarily damning argument against markets. Um, and I think it had pretty good results discursively in doing so. Uh, I, I, was, I was fairly happy with the number of uh, would-be social democrats, left liberals, DSA, but nationalize the firm types who who sort of came along with me here. Um, and so I hope you were able to, uh, I, I'm happy to answer the more, some more inside baseball marks questions to flesh out any of the sections that got short shrift here. Um, and I also hope you were able to uh, put yourself in the sort of broad group shoes here. Um, yeah, I'm excited to hear what, what folks have to say, what questions people have. Uh, anyone in the Zoom chat? Let me see. Yes. Please go ahead. Can people unmute themselves, organizers? Yes. OK, great. Uh, yeah, I just want to say uh, terrific talk. Uh, it gets better every time. Um, I guess I want to ask you to expand on, um, in terms of talking about the three market failures, I think um, the third one about externalities seems to be like, to me, the most conclusive, most convincing kind of airtight argument for, you know, why this particular market failure um, necessarily leads to communist conclusions. But um, I guess I want, I, I mean, and this is also like kind of very minor points, but I would like you to expand a little bit on um, the first and, and second market failures because um, so much of the argument seems to hinge upon saying, um, you know, even from the perspective of like a concerned social Democrat or left liberal, um, the nature of commodity society necessarily precludes um, fulfilling these specific conditions. And so when you talk about, for example, the, um, the prospective petty bourgeois proprietor who goes to the bank with a business model um, that doesn't conform to market rationality, um, you know, the the immediate uh, objection that occurs to me is, for example, like artisanal production, you know, artisanal bakeries, or do you think or I'm dangerous? Breweries. Dangerous? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, and the um, in terms of the second market failure, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it in the talk, but in the paper, you sort of concede that. Um, you know, that that kind of public provisioning would be possible with uh, with massive subsidies, right? And so to me, it seems to be like not so much a possibility that's that's logically precluded by the nature or structure of commodity society so much as like a question of political will, whether you can muster the political will um, to impose that kind of like massive provisioning of goods. And I think I'll leave it at those two for now, just in case anybody else has other questions. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Um, I think the first one in particular, I, I completely agree that, that it moved pretty briskly. Um, and, and both times that I've given it, I, I, I wish that I expanded on the third a little further. Um, I effectively wanna say, I, I think the strong version of the argument uh, at base level runs something like this. Um, if we ask ourselves what it means for parties not on either side of a particular transaction, for not on either side of this contract to be meaningfully affected, um, 
what we wind up doing is we're put in the position, first of all, of attempting to stipulate uh, what it is for these parties to be affected, why we ought to care about it, what it concretely means. Um, and the, the handling of this tends to be really cursory, right? So usually, if you look at how this is treated by folks like the, the sort of mainstream economists, political theorists we're talking to here, the answer would be, if we're interested in talking, how, what does it mean to capture these externalities? What, we're, what we tend to be interested in is something like, uh, there are a suite of approaches, none of them particularly good, because they deal with a set of technical problems. But in general, they like to do something like uh, hedonic regression. They like to look at something like, they, they try to figure out, they do things like look at changes in purchasing behavior. Uh, they do things, and also you get sometimes naive estimates of you know ridiculous questions, like how much money would you pay to, to stop like a, a species from going extinct, right? Uh, you get sort of like undecidable questions like these expressed in dollar terms, um, whether you work from like uh, explicit demand for this going backwards into talking, um, uh, into talking utility functions, or whether you get something like attempting to infer this from changes in demand behavior. Neither of these really make a lot of sense. Um, they make sense for certain limited cases, but in general, it, it, it's like a weird lacuna, right? There's not really an agreed upon means of doing this because even among uh, mainstream economists, because how we do this is going to be uh, pretty heavily normatively laden. Uh, and there, al there also isn't really agreement of what it means to handle the kind of uh, uh, downstream questions of how to take this impact and to do something like uh, address how we discount this over time, right? How do I figure out, you know, is, is this fish species being extinct for future generations? It, does this matter less than it being extinct now? Should we care more about, you know, the immiseration of future populations than present populations and so on? And the approaches to these are, are pretty unsatisfactory. They're pretty cursory. Um, the second kind of big uh, gap that you get looking at this works out to something like um, how it is that we actually handle these in a systemic sense, right? So you see treatment of this for really, really big stuff like pollution, you know, the case of the coal plant owner. Um, but you don't really see it handled in a satisfactory way for smaller social decisions. Uh, it's not really clear how you do this for something like car parking or something like the fact that a certain model of car might just be not the kind of thing we want to have around or, you know, running over children when it runs over them, you know, actually hurting them. And there is certainly not a pro an approach to making to sort of getting something meaningful out of this school of thought uh, when you come to cases where no market transaction is involved at any level, right? Where we have cases where two people doing something, that doing something not necessarily being a market transaction uh, is not money mediated, and they're doing something negatively affects a third party. Uh, and so as a sort of like, as a small example, right, of a, a case which you actually could bring up as like a non-money uh, positive externalities case, which is, you know, not something people discuss or think through. Uh, you could have something like the establishment, right, of like a local bowling club, right, is going to be uh, a sort of positive externality social action. I'm having a good time. Uh, you're having a good time, and uh, my having like brought into being this this club, my having sort of created for you the possibility of going out and, and bowling collectively with other people is going to leave everyone better off. Uh, and so thinking about how you price something like this becomes really, really obscure. Uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, um, <laughs> especially when 
uh, the kind of decision that you're talking about is one that's not going to be mediated by markets or money to begin with. So both of these are sides of the equation where uh, this kind of problematic really hasn't been taken seriously. So you, you hear people talk a lot about externalities, welfare economics, and so on. But you kind of get the sense that they don't really mean the conclusions that they're giving to you. Uh, the, only, the, the only thing that comes close to some sort of like basic agreement tends to be sort of big consensus stuff. Like, you know, barring, of course, the sort of political, economic, institutional arrangements that would render this impossible, uh, uh, you know, like nine and 10 economists in something like the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Chicago poll, will say that they support something like a heavy carbon tax, right? You know, like $100 a ton to capture all the harm that carbon is doing. But when it comes to elaborating the small cases or elaborating why, uh, the ball is really dropped here. And I think the reason the ball is dropped is pretty spooky. There's not actually a reason conceptually or argumentatively why you should limit the sort of scale at which you're concerned about this phenomenon. And there's also not a reason why you should be interested in limiting this to market mediated transactions. And it's really not clear how you come across the information, uh, all the stuff about the, the need of people, the good of those I live together with is supposed to arrive at the sort of liberal policymaker here. And so the sketches you get are ad hoc uh, and they're stupid, they're, they're quite empty. Um, but effectively, uh, it, this is a, so the, these two are, are sort of like gaps that motivate the remainder of the treatment, but the kind of, um, uh, the sort of big picture provocation that, that you're, that we're interested in saying here, uh, comes out to saying something like, well, if you actually think every social action affects people who aren't on either side of a contract. And again, we have no reason to think this isn't the case, right? Even something like a purchase, right? If I buy a pair of shoes, uh, you can't buy that pair of shoes. And you're probably likely to have something like, yeah, even if it's a very infinitesimal, you know, uh, even if it's a very infinitesimal variation, uh, some kind of change on something like uh, the the local price at which we're expected to enter into this kind of, that you, you can enter into this kind of transaction. So if you can't exclude certain sorts of social actions in general, and there isn't good reason to think you can, and it seems as if you ought to be adjusting uh, our basic decisions about how we come together to figure out uh, something like the ratios of we're producing this, we're producing that, we're making available um, these kinds of apartments and these kinds of stand mixers for bakers. Uh, it seems like what you're saying is all of those decisions have to be mediated by some kind of process that we absolutely can't specify at this point of figuring out the effect on the needs slash use, et cetera, right? Of everyone. And we've got to do so out across what is effectively going to turn into an infinite time horizon. We don't have good reason actually for saying that we ought to stop with just people in the here and now. And if you say like, okay, how are we gonna do this? The answer is you can't do this with prices or markets. What you just said is no commodity. You said no good. There should be no trade-off in production or consumption that reflects the, the value optimal level, that reflects uh, the sort of social surplus maximizing rate at which these trade-offs uh, would make possible exchange. And that's pretty weird. That's pretty spooky. And so when you entertain that, you then have to start thinking systematically about biting the bullet on the remainder of points here. Uh, and, and conversely, right, if you accept something like the sort of like, uh, like neo Neurotian slash what I call like Polanian sketch here, uh, something like uh, linear algebra slash um, 
markets are good enough for these boring sectors, right? The boring sectors of like car production or in-house production. Not that these actually are boring sectors. Um, the question is, you know, why, how are you delineating the ones that you think you ought to, I guess in their sketch, like vote on, set quotas on, ban, uh, limit? If there aren't actually persuasive grounds in which to do this, and it pretty quickly becomes, it seems as if what you've just arrived on is punting this big sphere of social action to the way in which we currently have judgments in this sphere of social action without really uh, giving us anything over what it is we can do today. And with a sort of like social democratic state in which you know we as communists are, are definitively not interested. Um, I think I sort of, uh, condensed your two questions into one question, because um, I think it's expanding on that big third general point that gets you to the smaller one. I hope that was somewhat helpful in, in recapitulating. I hope that made the stakes a little bit clearer. Was that at all helpful? Any follow-up? Um. Yeah, I mean, I find it fascinating, the, the uh, view of the world that's presupposed by mainstream economics and the whole notion of externalities. Uh, if you collected examples uh, that are taught as to what externalities were, you know, the train is passing the field and the, 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 the ash goes over there and sets the field on fire, you can always find a way to uh, put a value on that in terms of money. You know, you get them all together. I bet you would find uh, one that the examples were all fairly similar, uh, and that there were a lot of things. Let's say, for example, uh, the uh, time domination that Pistone would find from going to work and having your circadian rhythms for many years tied up to what capital does. You know, there's no way to put an externality on that, at least in terms of mainstream economics. But I would also contend that externalities is such a, a, a mush category that you could probably make anything an externality uh, if you reached out to do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the question I think also is, uh, uh, if in fact political freedom is the, reason, uh, is the ability to revisit and, uh, almost pragmatically uh, re-legislate something uh, and uh, make a different decision when something is working. It seems that the decisions that are made by the mathematical models of mainstream economics are irrevocable. They always turn out the solution which is proved to be best. Uh, and therefore uh, legal structures which are doing cost benefit analysis uh, which they now have to do in kind of any kind of legislation, will always come to the same conclusions. Uh, you know, and the, the, our notion of being on a train that we can't turn around uh, when you're in capitalism sort of says that there's something wrong with the models of mainstream economics in terms of how they model the world, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that example you gave, circadian rhythms and postone, is really strong. Uh, and you can, you can recapitulate that pretty quickly. So if you were to play devil's advocate here, um, the thing that the mainstream economists would want to say is uh, something along the lines of, um, well, you know, the dis you are, you're expected to get some disutility from work. You're weighing the disutility from work because you know, this, this disutility is supposed to be captured in, uh, you know, it's supposed to capture something like the dis this disruption of your circadian rhythm. Uh, and so you're supposed to be weighing this when deciding what jobs you will and won't take. Uh, but, you know, as, as you say, um, this line of argument doesn't really work if, if all the work that you can take looks like this. Uh, and, and in fact, it does. Um, it's not the case that we actually have labor markets that work such that you're able to uh, in all these cases, pick the uh, slightly less um, the slightly less social surplus reproducing optimal 
choice uh, production process for some particular commodity, some particular service that doesn't put you in the position of being really miserable all the time. It could just be that this is going to be that unless in fact you can ensure that you have uh, this like really infinite number of variegated along production technique, production processes for each good and service, um, you're not going to be able to ensure that this is actually taken into account. And the second point, yeah, externalities is much, anything can be an externality, 100%, 100%. Um, we are interested in something like, uh, as you say, like political freedom in terms of relitigating means uh, in terms of what works. You can identify this with something like, you know, conscious collective control. Um, and the, the basic sort of problematic that, that guides us here is figuring out uh, how to ensure that this conscious collective control is getting us to different judgments, judgments that do reflect what, what works, need, and so on, um, and actually gets us to people living uh, different, better lives, not under the yoke of these abstract, you know, dicta of value markets and so on. Um, so yeah, I think those are both great questions. Um, you know, I would really, add that just as a, a specific example, to go yeah. back to the financial crisis, uh, it seems that uh, the Swedes, when they had their crisis in the 90s, essentially took over all the banking firms and uh, 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 got rid of all the bad assets in them, made them, uh, uh, made them viable to a certain degree, and then sold them back to the, the private sector. That is an option that wasn't available to us uh, because it's legally foreclosed the way it's, it's set up in the constitution and all the other blockages that are set around it. In other words, we're not capable of taking what might be even under a Keynesian or a, a heterodox economic uh, version of capitalism. That might be the best, the most viable for some sort of workable capitalism for a while. You can't do that. You're kind of hemmed in. There are decisions that you can't make the way it's particularly set up. Absolutely. Anyone else in the Zoom? Um, I might start to answer some of these questions from the YouTube chat. Uh, Marwan, yes, what's up? Hey, um, amazing talk, thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering if you could expand on um, the um, alternatives to the aggregation of individual, individual preferences as a mean for social decision, and also maybe reassure the average liberal that would be worried about the threats that this could pose for good old fashioned democratic values in um, just institutional arrangements that we could come up with, like we could think of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to get the chance to expand on that a bit. Um, so, First of all, the difference between this and something like what people call preference aggregation. Uh, this is sort of what I, I say is the philosophical machinery that gets left out of the background of this. Um, I effectively propose um, that the categories of need, use, and so on aren't really filled in. And I suggest that even though Marx, you know, clearly can't, can't actually mean this, um, you see uh, need, uh, especially after you drop the, so, the sort of um, prima facie, like moral significance of the natural, unnatural need distinction uh, and use, which he uses interchangeably with utility in volume one of capital, kind of strangely, um, and something like well-being or the good are all basically driving at something. They're driving at, at something which is supposed to represent uh, the, the thing in which we're generically interested, that we want to bring about in the lives of people, that they uh, in our social actions in general. 
But the specific way in which we fill in this sketch is pretty underdetermined. Um, and I'm really not happy with the sketches you get of what fill this in. Either the one, you, you couldn't really pull one out of Marx because he doesn't actually give a particularly elaborate account of needs. Um, and where you see people take up needs, they usually just want to talk about primary goods. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I want to talk about um, how to fill in this content in a way which is going to get us to something which is a bit less paternalistic, which doesn't propose something like the sort of like contentious, you know, hedonistic uh, proposition that the utilitarian would avow, right? That being that um, uh, we're going to be value monists about something like an objective state of pleasure. This objective state of pleasure is the good or the kind of contentious thesis of something like uh, the more preference oriented, like preference aggregating post Sidgwick tradition, which is interested in postulating something like ipso facto, if you get you getting your preferences is the good, right? So I think we have good reason not to be happy with either of these. Uh, we don't really like the consequences. It seems awfully contentious to say that some objective state of pleasure as might be measured, you know, on something like an fMRI, Obviously, Bentham did not know about fMRIs, but he would have been a limited materialist, sorry, if, if he had known about this stuff. He was real into the, the natural in this way. Um, and uh, we're not going to be happy with something like the thesis that you getting your pref that you, you express a preference for something like chocolate and some lower preference for something like cake and, you know, you're getting this thing, ipso facto correlate, the, the difference between this expressed or revealed preference is going to equate to the difference in the good for you in general. Um, I also think we have reason not to be happy with the sort of Aristotelian picture we can use to fill in this account of, uh, of the good here. Um, something like the good for people is what allows them to do the thing which is supposed to be good, the sort of activity we take to be coextensive with the good. Um, you know, the activity that is eudaimonia, right? Uh, I think it's pretty contentious also to say, um, the good for people is this kind of activity, you know, oriented towards conditions, oriented towards perfection under conditions of autarchia and like identify this with a good simplicitaire. People have sort of real qualms, right? Um, what about, you know, things like my having glasses? What about cases where my ability to perform this kind of sort of perfection-oriented activity uh, conflict or have trade-offs with your ability to perform that sort of, you know, eudaimonic activity, right? What do we do in those cases? And they, they are going to conflict because the things that, that it takes for you to do something like uh, your baking, you know, that this is going to be it for you. And the things it takes for you to do something like be a jeweler who splits diamonds uh, are going to wildly vary in terms of what they require. Um, we're probably not going to be actually be able to say that we can be uh, we're not actually going to be able to be impartial on these. We're going to have to come to form trade-offs about them through some kind of weighing them. And the other issue is uh, there's a sort of tension between this, the sort of, you know, vision of the good as this kind of activity that happens under conditions of free association and the whole need stuff that we were interested in a second ago, you know. Um, the, and the sort of sleight of hand that you can perform to get out of this tension is to say something like um, need, we're interested in need insofar as they make this kind of activity possible, but I don't think most people are actually happy to bite that bullet. I think there are a lot of needs for things which don't, which are not actually prerequisites for this specific kind of activity, but which we have a pressing interest in. Um, it, it's, you know, 
classically paternalistic. And so to sort of uh, wriggle our way out of that, um, what I think we ought to look to, and I do this elsewhere, is to talk about the good as like the good for people as a kind of judgment. Um, and specifically, I know Philip said, read the values judgments pun. He was like, well, it's going to be Kantian. Um, I can do a little bit of a Kant riff here. Effectively, what it would be is something like analogous to a judgment of taste, right? And that it's not going to be um, universalizable. It's not going to be veridical. Um, what effectively this is saying is what we're interested in, if we're interested in the good for people, the good for people we live with, right? who we together constitute a society with, we're interested in your judgment of how your life is going and your judgment of your life. You know, I, I'm living a good, meaningful and fulfilling life. I'm living a life which is, is deficient in these ways because I don't get to do X or because, you know, this thing about my life is very bad. Uh, so I think these judgments are for sort of uh, basically like epistemological reasons, the kind of thing which we should be interested in morally. And for obvious reasons, these judgments don't actually coincide in this sort of like forward looking prudential value way with you getting what you want, right? So it might be the case that um, if, you, uh, if you get something that you said you wanted, your life will be better in this way, right? But we can't actually stipulate in the way which the sort of preference aggregators would want that these judgments that your doing so will always lead you to have your judgment of how good your life is, how meaningful it is, and so on, uh, be affected in this way. We can't actually promise that looking forward. It might be the case, it might coincide, but we don't want to postulate that it is. That seems really unrealistic. Also asking people about preferences is silly. No one really thinks you can do it anymore. This is why everyone's on the sort of reveal of preference wave. Um, it, makes, it makes the formal side of this really hard. It's basically, and again, you, you wind up with like pretty pressing forward looking issues. And I know we've, we've discussed a lot of this before vis-a-vis -vis like time preference and so on. Um, but basically what it's saying is we should be interested in this judgment. Your judgment might be against standards, but the standards of your judgment for what constitute a good life are going to be variable. They're going to change and that's completely fine. Uh, we're not going to, you know, write you up for having had imperfect information, right? When your standard for, when you realize, you know, I got to this point in my life and, and my life is good, or I tried this and it made me really happy. Um, so you base, so the baseline issues between these are going to be like at the sort of conceptual epistemic level. Vis-a-vis -vis democracy, um, this is basically the question of like how democracy fits onto the market, right? What we're looking for here is a way to be sure that we can enter the same kinds of like small atomic aggregating social decisions um, for which we presently use markets as a kind of social technology for judgment without making the same kinds of decisions which would result from having used values judgments, right? We want, we want our own judgments. Um, judgment that don't coincide with the weights or payoffs that markets would give us. Um, and so what we want is something that we can take that seems significantly more transparent, accountable, revisable, open to quite dramatic heterogeneity in ways of life that we can take into these sorts of granular, concrete decisions uh, without necessarily um, sorry, something in the chat made me laugh. Um, <laughs> uh, without necessarily winding up making the same decisions you would have otherwise. But this is not the same as saying, like, we've got to be, we're, we're sending you off to the maximizing minds, right? There are no maximizing minds, because when you construe things this way, you actually can work forward in terms of maximizing the, uh, a relative production of this good, this good, and that good. What it is instead is backwards looking. What it's looking at is changes in something like good that stem from changes in institutional arrangements, moving from, for instance, well, you know, uh, having this wide set of things being free 
to having this set of things being quoted, to having this set of things tied maybe in cases of scarcity to sort of this or that so flow desiderata. But the point is we ought to be able to judge in this sort of backwards looking way on these rather than on the individual commodities in this forward looking preference aggregating way. Um, again, also an exhausted answer. Sorry for the, for the length of that. Both of these questions were great because they gave me space to expand on stuff that got cut for time. Not that I did so good at on time, as a, as a couple chat commentators have reminded me. Um, Roxana? Yeah, thank you so much, Cordelia. Um, so my question is basically around the, um, whether there is kind of, whether it be desirable or um, even possible for there to be a kind of system logic of communism. Obviously, I think I know where you stand on this, and I tend to agree with you, but um, yeah, obviously capitalism uh, is defined by, you know, value as a social logic. Um, would it be desirable even to have a communist social logic around, um, say, maximizing welfare and minimizing labor, for instance? Um, would it be possible for that? Would it even be desirable? Yeah, great question. Before I answer that, I'm just going to say quick, because we're about to run over time. Um, I sort of foresaw this would happen. I'm personally going to stick around to respond to more comments from the uh, YouTube and so on, um, if I have time, um, or if, if, you know, permitting. So don't worry about that. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to stick around and get through these. Um, and uh, if I don't get to any of yours, perchance, I'll be happy to follow up with you in a different format at a different time. So about that question, I'll try to pick up the pace of the question responses here. Um, I don't think, to the extent we can talk about like a system logic and capital, we're, we're not proposing something that does the same sort of thing here. What we're just interested in doing is saying, you know, we've got these sorts of decisions which happen through uh, market and money and eventually value, giving you the kinds of weights you need to judge these sorts of trade-offs. Um, giving you the weights you need to make the decisions between doing this and doing that. And what we want to do is in a sort of open-ended, collective way, elaborate a means for making those same kinds of granular decisions without falling back uh, on making the same ones. But is this going to be a system logic or what have you know, right? There's not really any room for maximizing here. When we're interested in this sort of judgment about a life, you know, we can only be backwards looking. We can say maybe uh, the, the sort of institutional provision of salt for free is going great. No one, everyone's super happy about getting, getting all their salt for free. And it turns out that there's sort of no, <laughs> there's no adverse, there, there's, there's nothing bad that's ensuing from this because uh, it's something like a, a satiation good, right? Um, but we can't say something like, maximize the production of salt for utility, right? This, this becomes now like an ill-formed question. Uh, we just don't have the conceptual apparatus for doing it. Um, and again, hopefully the sort of ultimate sort of like normative desideratum here, which we're using to fill in the sketch of need or use or what have you, is intended to be as capacious and, and open-ended as possible. It's not intended to say, I think this is your need I think this need of yours is a fake need, I think, and so, right? We're, we don't, we don't wanna do that in the way that ultimately we would sort of be forced into the position of doing if we take up the thoroughgoing Aristotelian sense. Um, we want to leave it really open-ended for contestation, but we want to have a kind of tool that we can take into these sorts of granular interactions without having to uh, just like punt it to the same way we're making decisions now. Um, so yeah, not a system logic, not quote unquote totalizing because there's nothing you can maximize um, and ultimately cannot and does not contravene any sort of democratic elaboration of any, it, it, what it is is effectively just a means for elaborating what something like conscious collective control or what have you, how you can have a form of that which you can actually take into these granular interactions, which is more specific and less problematic than just saying, and we're gonna do a referendum. And referenda are fine. 
plebiscites are fine. You know, I'm not coming for resilience here, right? Um, but they, we want something in the background, which they, which the poet, which is not going to be the same as just background markets, right? Background markets is the sort of conditions on which voters are being asked to decide on subsidizing this or that or banning this or that. All right, Paul. Hi, uh, can, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Awesome. Uh, I'm curious about uh, motivation for this particular piece. I know it fits into uh, your larger current work, uh, but I, uh, in telling other people about it, they've asked me, well, uh, or they sort of agree with Marx that, um, you know, if you if you have a soul, it's uh, it's evil, right? <laughs> um, so I'm curious if, uh, like, looking for a normative, uh, uh, looking for an ethic in uh, value theory, is uh, is a rhetorical move, or if it's uh, or what the broader motivation for it is. Yeah, uh, great question. If you already think, if you have a heart, we oughtn't use markets or money, right? Then, <laughs> then this particular, at least the first half, the first two thirds of this, uh, probably, I'm not gonna say it would have no interest for you, but the interest for you is going to be more along the lines of demonstrating that these institutional sketches that we've seen from Marxists don't really help us make different decisions, don't really help us live different, um, and hopefully appreciate the necessity of doing something like elaborating this collectively. But I, I, I tend to think a lot of people think capitalism, right, considered generically. And I, I don't use capitalism in this paper because it's not a phrase Marx ever used famously. But a lot of people think capitalism is, you know, sort of obviously morally wrong. But just because they think this doesn't necessarily mean they have the uh, motive or ability to argue against markets and money as what's making like social life, social decision tick um, in the way that... Uh, you would want, right? Coming at this from a standpoint of, you know, Marx's capital being effectively a political speech act aimed at showing the sort of uh, irreducibility of money from the picture, right? You can't get rid of bad money, evil money, and keep the nice things about generalized commodity production, like Proudhonian's thought and so on. Um, so a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, capitalism sucks. Um, and they feel like poverty is bad. They feel like they, they're worried about the environment. This is like very common. And they, they get into reading Marx, right? And uh, they feel like, well, you know, like I have to get into this stuff. This is the sort of like, uh, like this is the guy, you know, or my DSA chapter assigned him. Um, <laughs> but... The quite if you ask them like, okay, can you explain to your relative, right? Or to your friend, why actually the problem is like Marx's one specific published intervention is supposed to show is uh, like lies fundamentally with money and markets. They're like, ah, oh, eh, whatever. Um, it, it's intimidating right, to explain why money and markets are the problem, or to explain that you can sort of advocate for something which we might be able to find desirable without them. Uh, it's, it's a big, big case. And a lot of people who are nominally anti-capitalist can't really make it. And if you can't make that case, uh, but you feel like capitalism is bad, uh, like lib smart liberals are gonna be able to sort of say to you, um, why should we take you seriously? You've never had, you know, uh, you say poverty is bad. I say poverty is bad too. That's why I support a UBI. 
or you know what what have you an earned income tax credit right a negative tax is the uh, uh, Chicago school equivalent um, or they say to you um, or sorry you say to them like uh, uh, the environment is crazy you know carbon is horrible and they say to you yeah you know I support carbon cap and trade myself right um, and these arguments kind of stall out. Uh, one side says you're not being realistic. Uh, you know, obviously capitalism can never reform this away. And the other side says, um, oh, you know, well, you haven't shown me why this sort of local problem that I that I know how to deal with through passing policy reforms. Uh, I don't know. I don't I don't see why this local problem requires the crazy stuff you're asking for that Marx is asking for the abolition of markets and money. And the place where this shows up conceptually and theoretically is in something like what political theorists call the ideal theoretic political tradition um, of talking about, you know, the sorts of institutions that realize the good uh, in a way basically analogous to what Marx would call the ideal average. Um, so the question is, right, can you show to a liberal that even if everything goes right, even if initial distributions are fine, you know, um, everyone gets, uh, you know, everyone is allocated an equal share of the capital stock at time zero. And even if we have, you know, in the sort of like Rawlsian sense, these transfer and distribution branches, like, like, like your good left liberal will already advocate for, something is still off, right? And so if we can say, even in this ideal case, something is still off, then we're having a really different kind of conversation. Um, and so this particular piece is written for uh, and was given to um, political philosophers and political theorists who are mostly not already on board, um, who are mostly sort of simple, like most you know, academic, sympathetic, uh, progressive left liberals. Um, and it attempts to make the case that even, even when we're idealizing, even when things go right, things go wrong. And so that's the real, the real audience. Um, but hopefully learning how to argue against this type of person has some value for, um, has some value for the sort of person who's like, I'm an anti-capitalist, but I don't know if that, I like, a, I, I feel like I should read Marx, but when I read Marx, I, I don't really know why I'm reading Marx. Um, Paul, do you want to follow up now or do you want to wait for a couple other questions first? Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Uh it might be a dangerous question, but if if there's a, a different way you would um uh formulate the argument for people with uh much worse moral intuitions like some of our audience. <laughs> um really I think. The sort of bottleneck here is because the arguments are supposed to hold analytically, they're kind of technical. Um, and this is the technical version, a little, it's a little closer to the technical version than the popularized version. Okay, cool. I, I can continue. Um, I can continue answering those questions. Yeah. Um, so effectively, I think the same case could be made morally to someone with sort of you know, generic, theoretically, right, there's not actually supposed to be a, a difference between the moral intuitions of your libertarian and the moral intuitions of your left liberal or what have you. Um, I, I can't speak to, you know, concerns of just like my politics are animus or whatever. But, um, you know, hopefully we, we progress up from talking about the good in like a pretty capacious sense to talking about this concrete political stuff and so uh, hopefully if we're able to find some, yeah, the, the bedrock, the, the, the bedrock disagreement with, um, I think with someone who's not a lib left liberal or what have you, uh, there's not really going to be one at the sort of like, at least like in principle at the like moral level, you know, like you're, your Nozickians and your Rawlsians actually have pretty similar conceptions of the good to the extent they're talking about that. They're generally gonna disagree like a couple levels up the chain at the institutional sort of level of argumentation. 
but I think we, uh, so, you know, I, I think those are sort of concerns you have to take up ad hoc, but uh, you know, I'm basically not really addressing those people because, uh, the population of people who are basically sympathetic, but are like, well, you know, what does this mean? Why would you want this? Why, how, how could this work is a lot bigger than the population of people who are like, um, you know, screw you. <laughs> yeah, so the I guess the answer is a sort of talk it through one-on-one. -on -one. Last question from the Zoom chat, and I guess I'll get to the uh, uh, the YouTube people. Is that me? I'm just trying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great talk. So I um let's see. Uh the question I have formulated was like um the three examples of market failure you formulated were really helpful for making sense of some of the stuff you mentioned to me before. Um my dad is kind of archetypal example, I think. And I was wondering like maybe his kinds of complaints would probably be about what about efficiency? And I know that's kind of like commonplace like remarks about it. I was just wondering like in a future like life we're living, like I don't know. I, I guess I'm just wondering how do you think about like the efficiency of the things we're producing in a kind of different society? Because I I don't I, I guess I don't think it's too silly a question because I do think it's reasonable to wonder about like certain life, like good life goals that you have might be related to the amount of things we're producing. And I'm just kind of wondering about the uh, sorts of ways that we get those things produced or the rate at which we do it. Personally, I would love to live like a much slower life in general, you know, just like comforting, calm, relaxing. I'm just wondering like for people who need, um, I don't know, a lot of soda. I don't yeah. know. What <laughs> <laughs> I think the efficiency question, it is interesting to me. Um, this more or less deals with efficiency as efficiency with regard to what? Um, like, can we agree the sort of like desideratum or like maximand against which we're judging whether things are efficient? And so that's sort of the, the level at which we're interested here. But, you know, I do think efficiency concerns are interesting. Um, you know, this gets you to like classic, like mechanism design -y type stuff. Um, yeah, effectively, th this is going to sound like a little bit of a dodge answer. I think efficiency concerns are really interesting and fun. I think they're basically all solvable, although a lot of them become harder to formulate if you discard uh, the sort of like simple social surplus maximization formula. It becomes harder to formally pin down these cases of, you know, allocative and distributive inefficiency. I guess the technical answer, sorry, this is probably going to go way into the weeds. I would say a high degree of distributive efficiency is guaranteed formally by the like final setup of concerning yourself mostly with institution level provision decisions. What I mean by this is um, making certain kinds of things free, making certain kinds of things quota and making certain kinds of things tied to X or Y. So just by being interested in these sorts of institutions, we're going to get really good distributive efficiency. And first of all, I have to note famously, right? Capitalism does real bad in distributive efficiency. Um, it does fine-ish on allocative efficiency, but you know, uh, the most obvious basic point that you get at the onset of marginal economics is, uh, wow, you know, declining marginal utility of income. Um, turns out you're going to, it's really, really hard to justify a non-flat income distribution. And, it, you know, considered statically, right, at a particular point in time, it's really hard to argue for, for like a sort of like mainstream economist that people shouldn't get a perfectly egalitarian uh, income distribution. And so, okay, yeah, we're clearly not doing too good on that. Because um, again, uh, the sort of like econ language here isn't concerned with moral desert. It's concerned with an outcome. Um, so to the extent you can justify distributive, sorry, distributive inequality uh, and still have do fine on distributional 
efficiency, it's going to be through something like, you know, like the Rawlsian difference principle, right? Um, it's going to be through something like um, the only difference in what you get versus what I get is going to be the smallest possible difference, which betters the worst off, right? You know, like I can give you, <laughs> I can give you the, as, as just as much as it would take to convince someone right on the edge of being a doctor, right? Or whatever. So, and I'm, I'm sort of uh, condensing a bit here, but right on the edge of being a doctor, to decide to be a doctor and go work in this free clinic, right? So you actually have to justify them, sort of like Rawlsian principle, um, that all inequality in terms of actually materially bettering the outcomes, which Rawls frames in terms of primary goods, of the absolute worst off in society. And capitalism is not even close to that. Good Lord. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, he can't justify any intergenerational transmission of wealth at all. Very hard for liberals to justify that. He can't justify, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of dubious whether you would even, like whether you would even have any, like it's perfectly possible that the difference in like distribution of income would be minute, would be teeny tiny. Allocative efficiency or the employment of different pieces of the capital stock and production efficiently uh, and commodities and so on, right? Um, is a more interesting question. I, if I were to argue this formally, and I think this is basically never people's main concern, there is a pretty robust literature um, talking about how to do so. The literature, I, I don't really like the phrase planning because um, I, I think what it means is often terminally unclear. And a lot of the time, if, if what you mean by planning is making the same decisions we make, but planner, right? And this is what, most of the uh, most of the early planning advocates met. Um, almost all the early marginal economists were fans of planning. Uh, you know, your Fabian socialists in England were fans of planning. They were just like, you know, you, you see in like uh, anti-communist econ textbooks like Samuelson in the 50s, you see these mainstream economists saying, yeah, planning's fine. It's at least as efficient, right? So this is a point that not only every economist is willing to concede, but actually the initial impetus for thinking about planning is that planning is supposedly supposed to be more efficient. It's just supposed to be somehow more allocatively efficient because we're able to make these decisions rationally. So I think that, you know, planning, non-planning, antinomy, not very, not really very significant, often very poorly specified, especially where you look at like indicative planning. Um, then the basic sort of question of like, what's the efficiency of planning? Well, again, planning was postulated first specifically because liberals thought it would be more efficient and the literature on like planning efficiency. And I, I don't really think this is something of which we should be super interested here is very extensive. Uh, I say this a lot as like a one-off, but at least two Nobel prizes were won just for work that came out of skeptical, like left liberal democratic economists theorizing planning. Um, most of Arrow and Urizawa's work on convex optimization comes out of their being interested in planning as like a way of formulating abstractly a bunch of economic problems. And then Hurwitz's, Arrow and Hurwitz's work on mechanism design, again, comes out of uh, theorizing like firm behavior in a theoretical planned economy. So the sort of like efficiency case mostly is either vague, spurious, or informational. The informational side, definitely, I think we, we clearly obviate here. Uh, the, the sort of like technical stuff isn't dealt with because I don't think it's very salient. <laughs> um, I think that's it as far as uh, Zoom chat. Uh, Zoom, oh, sorry, the like Zoom chat participant questions go. Um, Let's see, what else do we have in the YouTube? Uh, I'm gonna read together two from Ivarda. I think this is an interesting one. Uh, I guess I need to sit on it a little longer, but I'm not sure how domination critique is more solvable by social democracy than the three problems you present, especially because I think they overlap some. 
Wouldn't the critique from the Republican slash democracy school be that intervention from the current social democratic state is less tractable than a radical non-dominated administration? Hmm. Um, interesting questions. Those are actually pretty, I initially thought they're gonna be pretty similar, but those are actually pretty neatly decomposable. Um, so domination critique, uh, how is this more soluble? The sort of core issue is, it's not actually clear how to pose what the market does in terms of domination, at least in terms of the more formal sketches of domination that you get from neo-Republicans. And I talk about this a little, where I say, domination, What? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll recapitulate this sort of from, uh, from zero for the audience briefly. Domination is power, power over the choices of the person being dominated. The sort of paradigmatic case of domination is supposed to be the master-slave relationship, which is how you get dominus, which is going to be the root. And what it is is going to be power over someone's choices, and this power is going to be like the power of a master over a slave. And so this power is going to be, and so there's something specifically about this power that makes it thick, right? That makes it immediately morally salient, like the power of a master over a slave. Um, but what, right? What is it? Uh, we exert power over each other all the time. And so the way that people in the domination literature try to fill this in is they try to fill it in by talking about arbitrariness, uh, discursive isolation, interest tracking, and the participation of the dominated in the dominating decision. Uh, arbitrariness is supposed to be, it's the classic one. It's like, what makes the decision of a, of a master over a slave? You know, the point is being in this relationship is intrinsically bad. Why is it intrinsically bad? Because the uncertainty of being in this kind of relationship uh, necessarily poses, like the uncertainty of being in this relationship represents a kind of like psychological and probably also moral harm, which is in excess of the actual concrete harms that the person dominating you can impose upon you. So the idea is you want this concept such that even if I'm not doing anything to you at all, even if I'm not affecting you, my being in this relationship with you is automatically bad because of this uncertainty that comes from arbitrariness or your decision not being rule governed and that, uh, and that might come from, you know, not being able to look you in the eye. It's the sort of vague formulation you also get from these people in other places. Um, the arbitrariness, right, is the behavior of markets, is the sort of mediation of decisions that they do. Is it rule governed? Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Um, it, it, it is clearly rule governed. Um, it's at least as formally rule governed as a lot of the stuff that we want to say uh, is not domination on these grounds. Um, we can say that it's not sensitive to certain things that I wanted to be sensitive to, but the, the sort of like pure arbitrariness uh, in the long run is a pretty weak claim. So the closest would be there's some arbitrariness stemming from the divergence of values and prices, right? I don't know when I take my commodity to market if it in fact will sell for the price that I imagined. But I mean, this is, come on, let's be real. The psychological harm of this is not the problem of generalized commodity reduction. If it were, we would just, you know, we, we pass the values equals prices law or something. Um, clearly not what we're talking about here. Is this sort of market behavior uh, sensitive to the interests of those it's dominating? It is, actually. Uh, that's what it means for something like general equilibrium in the sort of, uh, like, De Bruyne case to be... Pareto optimal, right? It's it's actually it's going to give the it, it, it's going to give us distributions such that um, no one would prefer one distribution of goods sorry over the one they have without someone else not without someone else losing out comparatively uh, finding this new distribution of goods dispreferable. So it's clearly tracking your interests, right? Insofar as we identify your interests with goods in general. Goods as you like prefer them. And that is, you know, maybe that's not perfect, right? But we can't require every social decision track your interests perfectly. 
this tracks your interests better than like, you know, the government taxing you, right? Um, uh, and uh, as for discursive isolation, well, discursive isolation, no, it's clearly not discursively isolated. I, first of all, I have the power to, uh, you know, call a plebiscite, call a referendum, talk to my senator about banning or subsidizing this good. Lobby groups, concerted pressure groups do this all the time. Um, and also you could argue that this sort of discursive isolation, well, in fact, uh, my decision to be able to not sell a particular commodity or not buy a particular commodity is my making my voice heard in the sort of like big picture social valuation here. It's not that effective, right? If I'm not a big firm, I can't change the way we value this against that very much. But being very effective is clearly not a good rider, right? Uh, if I want taxes to be done away with, I can send a note to my senator saying, get rid of taxes, but it's not going to be super effective. But we actually, we, we like, if you are a Republican, you want like a fair tax to not be domination. You want just laws to increase freedom. And so the point is, it's really hard to identify why the thing we're talking about as market domination is domination. It doesn't really seem to fit the sort of master slave paradigm case at all, or the husband wife paradigm case at all. Um, it becomes super abstract. And you also run into issues where it's like, well, who's the agent here? Who's not, who's supposed to not be dominating, right? Um, it becomes sort of hard to, you know, we're very concerned with, uh, so dom the domination literature doesn't want non-agents to be able to dominate you. They don't want you to be able to be dominated by the clouds raining on you and, you know, altering your choice set by preventing you from going out for a job. Uh, so it has to be an agent. Uh, and so it can be corporate agents or group agents. These are the formal ways people set this up. But it can't be a diffuse concept. They don't really like this. Um, for I mean, it's pretty clear why you wouldn't like this, right? Because I can elaborate a lot of sort of properties of things or, or sort of, you know, it's sort of like saying like, um, how am I being dominated by my house? My house doesn't have a door on the ceiling. And it removes from me the choice of exiting my house via the ceiling. All right, that's true. My house doesn't have this door on the ceiling. And it has thereby, like, intrinsically, this choice for me. Uh, but, you know, wh what's happening here, right? <laughs> like, why am, I, why am I supposed to be fighting against this normatively? I can't write my house up for this. Am I supposed to write up the house builders? I mean, no, right? How could they have considered me? We clearly want them to be allowed to build houses without doors in the ceiling. And it just becomes a big mess um, when you start to let non-agents in the picture here as the sort of like culpable party. And so the question of domination by whom? Value, capital, markets, money is actually matters a lot, but it's really vague. Uh, it's like metaphysically vague. Um, and if you actually like chase it down on the conceptual level, you run into a set of big problems. So this is all to say, uh, the domination complaint is not even really properly formulable in the abstract sense in this sort of atomic case. The best way you could make the domination complaint would be through saying something like, would be through talking about, uh, trying to recapitulate it in terms of like your ability to pursue the activity that constitutes the good for people. Um, but, you know, I, I think I, I laid out my objections to that elsewhere. And at that point, you're pretty far out on your skis trying to draw the connection between these. Um, second point is, why is this more soluble than the three problems? Because the three problems boil down to saying no, no interaction can have trade-offs, which boil down to relative, uh, like trade-offs with regard to like aggregate social surplus or trade-offs with regard to value. Nothing can exchange in the way that it, it does if money is in the picture. Can't be done. Uh, so that's pretty hard for a social democrat to solve, right? If a social democrat is like, yeah, you know, I think every decision ought to be determined based on something like collective need. Uh, and sh for this reason, obviously, can't be mediated by money insofar as mediating these contracts by money um, has all these sort of consequences that we dislike. 
then, you know, I would say to that social Democrat, cool, right? You've already said you're a social Democrat who's like markets and money we don't need in the picture. I mean, that's what kind of social Democrat are you, right? You're just like a social Democrat in the classic Marxist sense of being just a regular old communist in German parliament or whatever. Um, so I think that, yeah. Um, second part of that, would in the critique from the public and democracy school booth that that intervention from the current social democratic state is less tractable. I think it's clearly not less tractable. Something like imposing a UBI is on the table, right? It's not super on the table. Uh, like it's not a likelihood, but it's sufficiently, at least in principle, implementable that you actually see politicians who win office arguing for it, right? Nixon famously had a sort of trial UBI experiment. You have, you know, you have cities uh, like Chicago attempted to give a UBI to women of color below a certain income level to see what it did. So a UBI is on the table. It is logically possible. It's politically hard, but it's logically possible for the sorts of things that would remedy Republican domination to be brought about. Um, and you see politicians proposing this, right? This is why, you know, Republicanism is quite hot with, uh, with liberals. Philip Pettit was brought in to rewrite the Constitution of Spain for real, right? Um, they really think they can solve these complaints. You'd have to do a lot of work to argue why they can't. And that work would boil down to arguing why um, this sort of like atomic case of a commodity exchange is domination. Um, and uh, I want to say, Will Roberts is working on this. And I think his attempt is good. It makes a lot of sense. We've talked about it. But his approach to doing so is going to be, is uh, without spoiling here, um, I, I do not believe Will Roberts is interested in defending the correspondence of what he calls market domination to domination as it exists in the like contemporary neo-Republican literature. He thinks that that identification in a lot of ways doesn't work, not to speak for him. So I'm sure his account of market domination will be good. I'm sure it will be compelling and analytically sound. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. We're going to exchange more work along those lines, but um, what, what, what he said is that, uh, in fact, he's not going to be defending the precise correspondence to domination as, as you see it already in the literature here. It's going to be taking a step back to try to recapitulate the concept. So I'll circle back to see market domination done up differently. Uh, not in terms of not involving, you know, agents or these sorts of effects on choice sets or deliberation or, you know, this sort of thing. I'll be, so everyone should look out for that and um, buy his new books, plural, as soon as they come out and his old book, if you haven't bought it yet, because um, such, a, such a nice and insightful guy. I, you can tell I'm a skeptic of domination. I, my big issue with it is I don't actually think it's prima facie morally important. Like, I don't think the project really makes sense. I think it's, candidly, I think it is re-describing, I think it, it's just describing power, parentheses, bad. And so as a move of thick description, it just boils down to identifying actions, which we already find to be bad. And so I'm not really sure it's useful in identifying a discrete type of harm. So for this reason, I'm a skeptic of the sort of, of most accounts of domination uh, in the neo-Republican literature. Um, but I want to sort of give it a fair shout here because um, both Will's work and Mao's work are fairly interested in the concept of domination here. Um, let's see. Final, yeah, we should wind up fairly soon. Final, I, I, am, I am pretty winded. Um, didn't eat lunch, didn't eat lunch. Final couple questions. Any thoughts on how to negate the abstract standards of judgments in order to concretize particular markets? Hmm. Negate the abstract standards of judgment in order to concretize particular markets. I might have to ask for further clarification on that. Um, I am not super sure just from that sentence alone, which abstract standards of judgment and what, what is meant by concretizing particular markets. A uh, final one that's got sent interface between process evaluation and what you might call on the ground instances where there's necessary recourse to optimization, maximization. 
Yeah. So effectively, um, this is attempting to give you a way out of optimizing and maximizing with regard to the same stuff that value is already optimizing and maximizing for. Um, and to do so in a way which is not, in fact, which does not encroach on all social life and social decision um, and is substantively different, not just in terms of like the sort of institutional way it comes about, but in terms of the actual judgments it makes. Um, social kinetics, Chris Ahmed brought up, super interesting. That sounds a lot like the question of stability to me, which is not something that I really deal with because I don't have a lot of, ex a lot of expertise on it. Um, we yeah, have the social stability of, of an arrangement like this is an interesting question um, and one that it would be interesting to talk about further. I think that about wraps up uh, what we have time for and, uh, and the questions. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Cordelia, for devoting so much of your time to elucidating these very interesting nuances in uh, both economic theory and Republican political theory. Uh, and uh, just a question now, uh, you are working on a book at the moment. And tell me, tell me about it quickly. Yeah, I'm working on a book. Uh, it'll hopefully be out soon, parentheses ish. I'm already behind the initial deadline. Um, I, uh, I had some some fairly major health problems over the past year or so. Um, and I don't recommend getting lupus if you want to be writing a lot of stuff. Um, so that would be my advice. I would say keep your small joints healthy. <laughs> um, yeah, so book will be, it's pretty close to done. It'll be out. Uh, I'm early next year target. Um, and uh, two... I this is made up of two and a half chapters of it. One of the chapters will be out as a paper before it's out as a book the, in a journal. And the second of these chapters hopefully will be out as a paper before it's out as a journal. But with peer review being what it is, that is in God's hands. So, so, uh, so could you give us a title or? A I actually can't give you a title. I, I, I do not believe that I am actually allowed to stipulate that the, choose the title, which is depressing. Um, but probably good because as I named this talk and I named it like 10 words, all of which are like five syllables. So, um, <laughs> you know, publishers free to question my, my instincts on that. <laughs> okay. Well, come back when the book's out and tell us some more about it. Thanks everybody for, for listening in. And, uh, of course you can look at it again on YouTube if there are any points that you don't remember out of it. <laughs> Join us tomorrow for uh, uh, Lisa Vogel's Marxism and the Oppression of Women at 40 years old. Yes. At 1 p.m. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks. Have a good day. See you tomorrow. I know I'm going to want to watch that one. Thank you for organizing this, everyone. Thanks for your time. <laughs>